range of stuff that he's going to show us, so we'll be keen to see what he's got and what he's got to tell us about uh, the gear he's got. Uh, John does sell things um, as a, a, a retail business as well as looking after his own bees. So, uh, John, uh, thanks for coming up, and I'll pass you this and uh, give John a welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Phil, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, just a bit of a background. My father was a beekeeper, a uh, hobby beekeeper. He's uh, had other beekeepers within his family. Uh, when he was a teenager, he went to visit cousins that had bees up on the Murray River. There were farmers come beekeepers up uh, near Aubrey. And he saw, uh, he helped them take honey off a big red gum honey flow. And so after that, he was very intrigued with bees. And so he got his first hives at 17. <clears throat> Uh, who he bought off his uncle, and his uncle was a commissioner for the railways, and during the war it was a good thing to keep bees, and they encouraged people to keep bees, and Uncle Len would write articles to put in the paper because they, the army or the military effort needed beeswax for their coating their ammunition and putting in the uh, bombs. They set the uh, explosives with the beeswax around it. So there was a huge demand for beeswax during the wartime. And because there was food shortages, honey was a sweetener and it took the pressure off sugar and things like that. So they tried to write articles to encourage people to grow veggies in their backyards and um, have bees and things like that, um, which should be a good thing. Uh, I was only told yesterday, and I don't know how true this is, that some of the new subdivisions around Geelong, there's a clause in there that you're not allowed to grow your own vegetables in your backyard. So I didn't, I didn't know that that was happening because they're building the houses with such minimal backyards, you'd probably be battling to build, uh, grow anything anyway. But anyway, so we're going to see whole changes in the future, I think. Um, so anyway, Dad got his first two hives and uh, he was so intrigued with them, he looked at them every day until he killed them. <laughs> so lesson learnt, don't go opening them up every day to look at them. So... Uh, <laughs> He then went up the street to another man whose name was Emond, didn't have the DS on the end, and he bought some hives off him and he started up. And then uh, down the track he built his hives up to a, a few and um, he was a teacher and uh, he married mum and they moved uh, his first school by himself as a country school. It was a one-man school at a place called Ruby, which is halfway between Leangatha and Currumburra. And so mum and dad and all these bits and pieces were all loaded up into a truck and uh, off they went down to the school at Ruby. And during the unloading, <clears throat> the removalist man slightly knocked the lid off a beehive. He was, he was unaware that he had beehives in, as part with the furniture. And as a result, he, he abandoned it, so Dad had to unload the removal van himself because he wasn't going back in there with bees. So uh, Dad kept bees down there, and, of course, I was born down there at Currumburra. And uh, <clears throat> one of the stories uh, of recent times, Dad's starting to fail, he's 90 and a half, uh, but I took him down to the uh, beekeeping group at uh, Lee and Gatha. We got there a bit early and in the dark we're sitting there. And in those times when he was a beekeeper down there, he was basically he was the only beekeeper to speak of in that area. There was very, very few beekeepers. And uh, he was known as the beekeeping teacher. Um, and uh, we sat out the front and... Anyway, about a few people came along before the doors were opened and Dad said, oh, well, you'll have six people to uh, hear you talk. Anyway, of course, when the doors opened and everyone turned up, much to his amazement, there were 60 people in the room and he couldn't believe it. There could be 60 people in Lee and Gather wanting to have bees. But anyway, he told a story about the school had a horse yard for the kids used to ride their horses to school. Well... At that time, the kids stopped riding their horses and they must have come on buses or whatever. I don't know how they got there. So the, yeah, the paddock was empty. So he put his bees in the paddock and along the fence and the school committee decided they'd plough the paddock up and plant potatoes to make some money for the school kids and school. So he went off on holidays back home to Geelong. While he was away, they had a horse with a single 
furrow plough scuffling the uh, dirt up onto the potatoes, you know, to make more potatoes. Unfortunately, the horse upset the bees and the two men that were operating this plough got stung. One of them got stung so badly around his ears that the ears lobes swelled up and hung down to his shoulders. <laughs> So, so uh, I always thought that was a good story. <laughs> but, but, you know, you drive along and you say, oh, I climbed up that steeple and got a swarm out of there. And I think, God, you're mad. Dude. Nowadays you wouldn't be allowed to go up there and do that. But anyway, so then we moved back to Geelong because that's where, that's where my, mother's, my mother's people were from Little River and Dad's family had always lived in Geelong West. So we went back there. Um, and he used to commute up to Melbourne on the train each day for school and then come back. Uh, after three years in Melbourne, then three years back in Geelong. And uh, that's what happened for many years. And then he became principal of Cryo South and he, that's where he pulled up stumps at the end and, and bought the property next to mine at Mount Denise and he spent his retirement there. Very handy because he was nailing up bee boxes and frames and everything next door. So it was very, very handy. Um, we, worked, we kept bees together for a long time. When I first started working, I started for Hawks Brothers in Geelong. You may remember Yarra Junction Hardware was Thrifty Link. Uh, Otterays were Homestead, I don't know if they're still there. Uh, Several Timber and Hardware was Thrifty Link. I used to come up here as a rep and uh, help them with their hardware needs. And then eventually they were taken over by John Danks. And so I worked for Danks for 11 years. And then one day I just said, I turned 40 and I thought, if ever I'm going to be a beekeeper, I've got to jump now. So i have been building up the bees, building up the bees, and it was a bit like foxtrot. One step forward, one step sideways, and one step backwards or something like that, or two steps sideways. So anyway, you, I found that I couldn't be a commercial beekeeper while I still had employment, and corporate world was wanting more and more out of us salesmen, and they were sending me to Tasmania and places like that, which made it very, very hard to maintain what I was doing with the bees. So I, I jumped and I had a part-time job for Mitre 10 store in, on weekends in Geelong for a few years and that paid the groceries while the business built up enough that I was able to jump. And now I have something like eight part-time or casual workers. Um, two of them are five days a week and the rest are generally one or two days a week depending on what jobs and what work we've got. So we, we make honey... We make queen bees, we package honey, and we have a salesman who goes around all the shops around Geelong and environs, Bellarine Peninsula and uh, coast, and we sell our own honey as Edmunds Honey and Geelong Honey to those areas. Um, and the business is just slowly, slowly, just gets a little bit bigger each year. And about four years ago, five years ago, my friend Leon Layton, I'd been importing bee boxes from New Zealand because they were the best quality pine boxes I could get um, and he used to get them off me and sell them to the little beekeepers around the place and I used to import or still do import plastic frames from New Zealand as well and so we'd been working together and one day he rang me up and said come and see me and I went out there and he said I only got two months to live I've got uh, mesothelioma and sure enough two months later he died but just before that we did a deal and I took over his bee supplies business. That was just before the boom and so since then it's been rather hectic with people all coming in wanting bee suits, gloves, smokers and, and bee boxes already made up. Uh, some people go and make them up themselves but most of the people I find come in and buy them uh, off the shelf pre-made. There's a reason for that because we wax dip and paint the boxes as well. So therefore, if you wax dip your boxes. Now, I was going to show you something with this other box, uh, the box you saw before with the handholds. Um, one thing I'd suggest you've got to be careful of is you either wax dip the box in hot wax, which is not all that easy if you haven't got the equipment, but buy some copper naphthenate from a wattle trade store. I don't even know what they, if they still call them wattle trade outlets, but put copper naphthenate underneath there because um, when I first started I didn't have a handhold machine to put the handholds in and I put the cleats on but the problem with the cleats is they rotted the box underneath and so therefore you must 
uh, have copper naphthenate or hot wax treatment so the boxes don't rot. The other trick too is if you look at Queensland and that where they use them all the time, they put the cleat up here. This is the weakest part of the box along the, uh, the rabbit. And so by putting it up there, you strengthen that and they're not less likely to break off or whatever. But they also use loaders, so the loader slips underneath and it lifts up and it's, it's um, easier when it's at or along the top. But um, cleats are a good idea and uh, they don't really take up any more space on the, when you're moving because I use spring clips and I have to allow for that. And all my bees these days go on, a, uh, on pallets and get lifted up with a loader because uh, I've now got a new hip so I'm um, man of steel. It's a, bit of a, it's a bit of a problem when you go through the, uh, the detector in Melbourne, and I can tell a bit of a joke story about that recently. Getting back to the, the real story, so what happened is many years ago we just operated ordinary full-depth equipment, like probably most of you do, and I happened to be... <laughs> It would have been 30, 40 years ago, I suppose, thereabouts, visiting a beekeeper in Geelong, and he had all these interesting size frames, including one that was this size. And it had a, it had a big patch of brood. This is just one that's been kicking around. had a big patch of brood like that. And I was intrigued, and I said, gee, I said, Peter, what's this? And he said, that's a jumbo frame. And he was a school teacher at the uh, tech school, and he was an Englishman, and he'd given the kids all the project. Every kid had to make up a different hive. All the hives you can get from all around the world, you know. So they had, you know, every British one. The British had got huge numbers of different hives. So they made up all these different hives, the frames, box, the whole bit, and he put bees in them. And at that time, he had permission to put them in the Geelong Botanic Gardens. So they all sat in the Botanic Gardens. You'd walk around, look at the flowers and that, and you'd spot the bees just at the back of the beds all around. And he said to me, of all the hives he made, this was the most successful and the one that made the, the best bees and best honey. So well, I, was, I was intrigued, you know. Went in there and never went any further. And beekeeping's a bit like that. You get snippets of ideas everywhere. Don't forget them, just remember them, because some stage down the track they'll make sense and it will fit together in your little jigsaw of the, what you should be doing. Many years ago I heard a fellow called Ian Fenslow give a speech, a, a retired commercial beekeeper now, from Bendigo. Wrote down copious notes, went home. That was as much as I did. Ten years or so later I was cleaning up and found these pieces of paper. I thought, gee, I wish I had done all those ideas. They all made sense to me then. At that time they didn't make sense to me. But um, he's told, one of the things he said was commercial beekeeping is a numbers game. He said, you're right. If you've got enough numbers and you make a box of honey off each one, you, you can become very efficient and make a lot of honey. So, so sometime later, about 25 years ago, I was cutting... 12-inch boards of timber that I'd salvaged from Fords in Geelong, and it's an inch and a quarter thick, and I was cutting it and dressing it and making it into eight-frame standard boxes. And I thought, why am I doing that? Peter said that these jumbo frames were the go. So I started making up jumbo hives. So therefore they take the frame, which is two inches or 50 mils deeper, and it took a little bit of work for a start, I had the frames made by a fellow who's since passed away, um, but we, I still now get them from China, and they make them to size for me. And um, I, I drew them out, got them going. I found the best way to do it is, ironically, two ideal boxes is the same size as a jumbo. So when you put two of them on top of a hot standard hive or another jumbo hive, put your frames in here, draw them out. They always draw them much better in the second box rather than the bottom box. Because the other thing too is if they're done up there and filled up properly, they'll draw them right to the bottom, not like this. So th that was probably one that was done in a bottom box. But Fifty mils deeper. Oh, okay. And I thought it 
Yes, and I thought I was doing something completely different to everyone else until I went and spoke at Yadran one day showing them and they said, what's new about that? Because you know those hives you see over in there where they pull the frames out the back in their bee uh, colonies and that? That's that size, but just a little bit not quite as long. It's the same depth, but just a little bit shorter. Um, Germany's the same too, apparently. Um, and, and I'll give you an example. There's a full depth. So, so there's the difference. right? -o. Now, the other thing I really like is plastic frames. It doesn't really matter about the colour, but most beekeepers I find like black. They seem to go for black. Black with full of nice white honeycomb looks really good. But um, also, too, if you're grafting, uh, making baby bees, you know, we're grafting the babies to make queens, it's much easier with black. So because with the black, you can actually see, the, see them much better. Nowadays, we import... Uh, I import from a, my man over in China... Um, the frames, and they come with the eyelets already inserted. And putting the eyelets in is the most tiresome and irksome job around the place. But they must have a machine. They push them in. Sometimes they get them a bit bent or whatever, but they're generally they're right, and you can make up your frame. What I'd suggest is when you make up your frame, I had someone the other day ring up wanting screws to screw the, the top bars on. Don't ever put screws in your top bar. Put the thinnest, either staple or one nail, thin nail, in the top because the weakest part of your frame is the lug. And when you damage the fibres in the timber there, that's what eventually will break off and, and break away. So use either a staple gun, uh, but we always glue the frames. We use um, Sally's Durabond or Sika uh, have an equivalent, uh, polyurethane glue. And very, very strong. Durabond, I think they call it. Very strong and uh, they last a long time. Um, now, but what I... John, what, yes? Uh, going back to the glue, I did hear someone say that they reckon there was some problem with toxicity of normal PVA glue. Is Durabond... Doesn't seem, doesn't seem to be. It says on the back of the label, it says uh, carcinogenic. If you get it, uh, <laughs> don't get on your skin. But I haven't had any of my workers die yet, so <laughs> that seems to be very slow. <laughs> <laughs> we'll always employ workers that smoke, because <laughs> you can always say that it's the smoking that killed you. <laughs> right, right oh, now. Um, Full, full depth, WSP, or now becoming called three-quarter frames. I believe in the future people will be changing to these three-quarter WSP frames. WSP was named after William Spencer, Stan uh, uh, William Spencer Pender, um, who was uh, the founder of Penders in... New South Wales, who were the biggest and best beekeeping operation um, supplies in the old days, but they had a big fire and they've lost a lot of their, their strength now. But the reason I say that is in New Zealand they're changing over to this size because of works oh and yeah. The weight factor, this, this hive here, when I weigh it, if you have to go to the almonds or whatever, and that's full of bees and full of honey, to go to the bee almonds will be somewhere between 42 and 50 kilos of weight. Whereas, possibly, when, when I was about 25, Dad used to say, why don't we change over to ideals? You know, like this. No, 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 we don't want ideals. No, no, I'll always be adamant. He always reckoned that ideals were the best size because he was feeling the weight factor. That full of honey can be 20 kilos. It'll be somewhere between 15 and 20, depending on when it's full of honey. So you'll extract generally about 12 kilos average of honey out of an ideal. You'll get your 20 out of a WSP. But the strange thing about a WSP is the bees, for some reason, because of that size, they make the frames fatter. And normally if you have a full depth box in the second, they don't ever, they always cup, generally cup the frames a little bit because they've always got in mind we're going to lay some brood in that frame. And so as a result, they don't fill them out as much. It's not unusual to get nearly as much honey in a WSP as what you will in a full depth box above. But the thing that I like, and there's, there's a plastic equivalent, and you get more honey in them again because there's 
there's more area, you'll get more brood because the, you don't lose as much with the um, top bar and bottom bar because they're thinner. Uh, harder to get them to start plastic, but once they've started them, drawn them out, they're much better. I've now bought a machine that'll spray the wax onto them. I haven't used it yet, uh, but they tell me that once you spray it on, you'll get it's much better. The bees will accept it a lot quicker and draw it a lot better. So that's, that's, that's what we do there. And ideals, I use ideals for quite a few things. We put a little strip in it like this. It is a bit better if you make it a little bit deeper. Um, because we draw that out with no wires in it to make honeycomb. So we can cut out the honeycomb and sell it as cut comb. We also sell full frames like this for $35 each to the restaurants and people who want natural, pure honey. We find we get a lot of Indians and Arabs and things like that come. They don't trust what's in a jar. They think that's been adulterated, whereas if it's in a frame like that, it must be right. So we, we, don't, we don't upset them. You can also, I, I own the moulds now for this easy comb and these, these little four little plastics on each side. Six of them fit in an eight frame box or seven in a ten frame box. The trick to the using these is you have a good strong hive when the, the, uh, with an excluder. When the top box is nearly filling up or on the way and it's a good honey flow, bees are strong, lift it up, put the ideal in under here, the bees come up to finish off and then they'll start working there. It won't work if you put just one frame or two frames in a box because they'll work everything else except the plastic. Um, and also uh, the bees have got to be strong and you've got to have a good honey flow. But if you do, I have had people fill these up uh, on uh, red gum and orange and uh, um, uh, leatherwood in about 10 days and it's highly profitable because that is 180 to 200 grams of honey and, and wax and uh, they generally wholesale for about nine or ten dollars, selling the shops between fifteen and eighteen for just ordinary honey. But if you've got manuka, uh, which you can't spin out normally, ideal in these because you don't have to worry. You just sell it to them as a hobby. Um, and at the Salamanca market, they sell these sections full of leatherwood honey for thirty dollars a pop. So they make very, very good money. The Asian tourists really go for them. And they just clip off. There's four little lugs that they sit on, and when you take it off, you put a fresh a replacement plastic box back on. Yeah, and you clip a lid on the top, and there's a little lid clips on. 70 cents for a, the little base and the lid, and you just put them on as you need them. Um, we also will be able to spray the wax onto them in the future, so that'll make put the price up a little bit, or you can put the wax on yourself. Fiddly job. Uh, with a roller. Shirley's done that and he's, he's, he's fiddly, but um, uh, the spraying will be a lot better. Um, but these are becoming very, very popular. I've sold a lot of them now into Western Australia. They're now, nearly all their honeys over there are medicinal, so they've got a huge market for selling their honeycomb as medicinal. The other strange thing is because you don't cut it, you tamper with it or alter it, it doesn't go candy as long as it's not canola or some of one of those things like that, but just good ordering honey, two years later, will still be liquid because you haven't fiddled with it, you haven't altered it, yeah. Um, just you've mentioned spraying wax a number of times, like yeah. with the boxes and also these. Yeah. How do you sterilise it so that disease isn't spread? Um, basically, disease isn't spread in beeswax, you'll find. Um, Laurie Braybrook's 94 now and he was the senior apiary inspector for years and he looked and looked and looked to try and find whether AFB was spread in beeswax. As long as the beeswax has been melted up and, and cooked, it, the heat actually kills the, 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 kills, yeah, kills the uh, spores. They never ever were able to say the beekeeper got AFB from that beeswax foundation. They always found that the heating process... He also believed that the, the spores got coated in the beeswax and that smothered them somehow and made them in, inoperative to, the, to transferring disease. Uh, the wax we use for sterilising the boxes is actually microcrystalline wax. I don't use paraffin wax. Some people use paraffin wax. Some use half paraffin and, and micro wax. Paraffin wax is, melts at such a low temperature that on our hot days it disappears and it'll leach out of its boxes and disappear. Whereas the micro wax we bring in as a melting point of 70, so 
if it gets to 70, your bees are going to be cooked, but the wax will still be there. So, um, <laughs> so uh, that's the excluders I, I bring in from New Zealand. You might see equivalent Chinese ones. I don't recommend them because after about five years they go brittle and break and, and go funny. These last for a long, long time. Uh, I've had these for years and some of them are sitting out in the sun where they shouldn't be and whatever. Um, and they work really well. The first, how I got onto them is I was at a New South Wales conference and at that stage they were sending uh, bees to Canada. Uh, I think they still do, but I'm not sure, package bee business. They had to strain the bees into the packages through excluders and they told me that these work the best and quickest of all the excluders on the market. Um, so that's why I bought them. I find they're good, they're easy to use, easy, uh, and you don't have to worry about sticking your hive tool in and bending the wires. Quite a few people now get excluders, they bend the wire with the hive tool, and then they're not an excluder anymore, are they? So these uh, work really well, very forgiving. Now, I was um, very interested... Oh, no trouble, just run a, a, a um, scraper over them. And if they're really dirty, just put them in um, some uh, soapy water, Real, get a big handful of um, Rinso, Momo, put it in the water. It turns the, uh, the beeswax into soap, hit them with the karcher, they come up as brand new. So no problem at all. Now, I, I was very intrigued listening to you talk about hive mats and things, a subject that I very dear to my heart. Now because it'll lead into another thing. For some time, we have been using these pieces of plastic, which are cut to the size of the whole box, a bit around the edge. And we leave them on the hive for most of the year, uh, probably in future all of the year. Uh, but in the past, we always put them on for winter. The bees, if they're put on early enough in the autumn, will propolise the plastic all around so it becomes completely sealed. The other reason for it is when, you know, in your house, in a shed like this, on a cold day, you get condensation underneath. But if you have a ceiling and an air gap in between, you don't get the condensation. Moisture in the hive is detrimental to your bees. So that's why people in the past have always had small hive mats for the bees to cluster under. This, I pinched this idea from Canada. And I see that they've actually gone one step further now. And when I go over there to Appamondia in September, I'm going to find out what they actually are using. But they actually have a blanket type of mat now that they can peel back. And it must have a lot of insulation in it because they have a lot of cold uh, issues over there. What we do is, as well as that, we have the silver paper, which we put on the top down in the winter time to reflect the heat back into the cluster of bees, keep them warm, and in the summer time to reflect the heat back out from the bees. And if it's a windy day, I'm sure you'll hear the swearing up here. <laughs> you sometimes have to have two hive tools, one on each end to make sure it doesn't blow away before you put your lid back on or whatever. So uh, that's the only thing that's a bit of a problem is, the, is what happens there. But, uh, but I do think it's a good idea. It's entrapment of air because what happens is when the bees get in a cavity of a tree or in the house or whatever, they always get up to where they can get the top. So they, they build down because they live in a bubble of air and they stay in that bubble of air, they can control it with their bodies and their hairs on them and whatever, and they, they take turns of standing on the outside. And, you know, the, uh, some of the bees are designated to be heater bees and they consume uh, honey to make their wing muscles vibrate. They can unhook their wings and they vibrate their, their, their wing muscles. That generates heat. And... Uh, if you want to see an interesting article on that, Nikolai Felzine uh, down at uh, Dingley, he's got terrific uh, photos of it. He's used a heat camera and you can actually put the cursor on the little dots of white or red or yellow and it'll tell you the temperature of the bees that are the heater bees. And they actually, uh, the hottest one's about 43 degrees in there warming the hive up. When you see a comb and you see the empty cells that are interspersed through the comb, that's where the bees actually go in and they stand in there and they vibrate to warm the brood, keep the brood warm. That's why the, once the bees start making brood, 
Then they start having to keep themselves warm. To keep themselves warm, they've got to then consume honey. That's why it doesn't pay to try and stimulate them and get them going too soon. And I'll lead to that, onto that story in a minute about what could be a problem. Um, so now the other thing too is you had the empty box that you didn't know what to do with on the top. Quite simple, we just fold the corner back like so. Or you can pull it back and leave just a B space on the end. We generally have our queen excluder on the top as well, like that. And if the bees want to come up around, they'll come up. If they don't want to come up, they stay under here and stay warm. The other reason why they stay warm like that, conservation of heat, is because the lid either has no vents in it at all, vents in lid are old fashioned. The only thing vents are good for is the spiders to get in there and hide in there and um, play. And these lids now are much stronger because I've actually imported Chinese fir timber uh, for the lids because um, in the past we've used plywood. I don't like using uh, WeatherTex because WeatherTex is exceptionally heavy and also if you put it in hot wax it can explode. And I have already had one bad exp experience of burning myself with an exploding masonite uh, clearer board. So the fir timber smells beautiful. It's all slats all joined together. We actually put, make sure we put a staple in each one so none of them have come apart, none of them have split or anything so far. It's been successful. Whereas if you use the plywood like this, you may see there's a slight bow and that's what happens with the plywood over time. The Chinese fur tends to stay straight, so therefore we don't have leakage problems around here. We don't have a leakage pro a problem with the air because we've got our plastic there to make up for that. But this is the lids I prefer. They're flat lids because in a way I don't have to spend time scraping out the honeycomb out of the lid, out of the mess, because it's always messy burr comb in the lid. I want the bees to put the honey where... I can extract it or get to it without any fuss, bother or whatever. Whereas, invariably on a good honey flow, they'll put two inches of, or an inch and a half of burr comb all through there, and by geez, it's messy. And you get all kept. Now, what happens is when people get messy, and I, I don't wear gloves, I'll give you another tip. My father was very, very um, gung-ho. He never worried about being stung. It did... Uh, you know, he, he gets, wouldn't wear a veil, he gets stung around the eyes, on the nose or whatever. He drizzled about it once on the end of the nose, of course, but he would, and he never worried much about us kids getting stung. And so we used to get belted up, and after about 11 stings, we thought that was the equivalent of a snake bite, and we'd better get away from it because we're going to die, you know? So it was always a good excuse to nick off. We would have helped him for a lot more if he had a, made sure we didn't get stung. But anyway, what happened is... Um, uh, all the farms who kept the bees, usually the kids that lived on the farms had motorbikes, guns and all those things that we didn't have as kids in the city, so of course it was always a good excuse to nick off and play with them. So, but Dad never wore gloves, never wore veils much and tended to get stung all the time. He just thought it was part of it. When we'd drive along in the old car, you know, he'd have the back seat out. You know, the, the police would have a heart attack these days. Pull the back seat out, no seat belts. All the bee boxes stacked in the back with us kids perched up on the top of them. <laughs> and, you know, M locks around them. And when you're going along with an M lock, the bee, the hive does this a bit and the bees all come out and we'd be going along and the windows would all be covered in bees all flying up and down the windows. And us kids would sit in there like this because we knew if we touched the bees or went anywhere near them, we'd get stung. You know, you learn to... The bees go to the window while you're moving, you know. Don't move, touch them. You know? Even a dead bee can sting you. They look dead, but they... Yeah, they look dead, but they not. They'll get, they'll get you. Anyway... And, and in those days, you'd go to a service station and they'd fill the car up for you, wouldn't they? Well, you ought to have seen the look on their face when they'd come out to put the petrol in. Shit, bees! <laughs> All coming up and down the windows. We just, 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 it was just a normal thing. We, we, we learnt to live with it, you know. We had bees in the backyard all our lives. That was another trick Dad had. We had a big shed, oh, similar to this, and it had big doors like this to open up, or at least for wider than a car, and he'd put the bees along beside those doors and it had a gap about six or eight inches along the bottom. So the bees all flew out. So when he wanted to work on his bees, he'd just open up the doors and work his bees and they'd fly and whatever. When he was finished, close the doors and the bees would go in. All the neighbours and that, you know, we never had any complaints because they couldn't see the bees, so they never... 
complained. So if, you, if you've got problems in the, keeping bees in an area, build a shed with doors at, <laughs> and a space underneath them to fly in and out. It works for Charge Charm. Um, you're saying about insulation. I've never worried about the handholds um, nowadays because the timber is about an inch and a quarter generally. It's a bit heavier, but that's not a problem. We used to hand load the bees in the past or then use the loader, but we often, Dad and myself, would get one end, end of a hive each because it was quicker than using the loader. It kept us strong, I suppose. That was an Armstrong method. But nowadays it's much better. I just I often load up a load of bees, you know, and... 20 minutes, 40 minutes, and I think, gee, it's just so easy. And the, all I've got to do is pull on the lever and up she goes, you know, and four at a time, so it's much easier. Um, now, getting back to being stung. Being stung no, I'll, I have lots of other theories about being stung. It'll take all day, but I have had, I, I've, had, I've had workers that have had reactions... One of them I thought was going to die in the truck, but anyway, he didn't. Um, eyes went red, he was all itchy and hives and hot and sweating and all of that. And then when we got, the, we had to drive about 20 minutes to get to a chemist, we hopped out of the truck, couldn't get close to the we, chemist, had to walk 300 yards, go in there at about 9 o'clock at night, and the girl, I said to the girl, this man's having a reaction to a bee sting, he needs some antihistamines or something. I can't give you anything. You have to go to a doctor. So we walk back to the truck. We try to find the medical centre. And he goes, oh, I'm feeling better now. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> since then he's been stung, no effect. So sometimes you can have effect. Every bee sting's going to be different because the age of the bee, what they've been fed on as a baby, all change the bee sting venom. And also depends on where you've been stung on your body. Sometimes around your hands where it's hard and that is not nowhere near as bad as when they climb up the leg of your pants and things like that. So, um, yeah, so anyway. Uh, getting back to... I went to Korea. And while I was over in Korea, I discovered these blue jackets. And um, when I first saw them, I was very sceptical. These were wasp jackets. And over there, they have wasps as big as your finger. And uh, they can kill you, actually, when they sting. And um, anyway, much to their horror, in one of the places, uh, they have little old... Gran generally, Grandma gets around with a little stinker. The big wasp, a big... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, sting yeah, yeah, big one, yeah. Well, they have them there. And um, Grandma gets around in front of the hives with a, 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 a bamboo sticks. Or, um, you know, like a rattan. And, they, and the, they, what, they hover in front of the hive and grandma hits them and knocks them to the ground and kills them, you know. But, like you hitting rubber? Yeah. But anyway, I, so I picked one up and it was hanging onto it by its wings and it was trying to get me and they were all horrified because they thought I was going to get stung, so I got rid of it quick. But anyway, believe it or not, they wear suits made out of this or even jackets. And... Don't they sting you that? They don't sting you through that. It's as light, cool, and, you know, next time you're wearing your cotton bee suit and it's hot and stinking and what used to happen is I'd go to the bees, I'd wear my cotton jacket or overalls and I would always perspire with the hot day. I wouldn't drink enough water, come home, I'd have cramps and night time I'd be crampy because I hadn't drunk enough because you don't drink. These you can actually drink through. You just hold the bottle up and you can actually drink through. So you don't have to, doesn't interfere. doesn't interfere with your work. But the other thing too, um, yeah, and easy, cool, light to wear. And, uh, but you wear a hat inside. I used to import hats with a wire thing around them. But nowadays I just go down to Kmart and for $7 you can buy a, a luminous green, a red or yellow, uh, orange or yellow high-vis hat for 7 bucks wear it in there. But the trick, trick is to put a pin, a safety pin through there, and that stops it from flopping around and works like a treat. And uh, don't walk too close to the uh, barbed wire fence. $50. Why do they sting you? They don't sting you through it. They will through this bit, so don't let it get up, don't let it get up against That's why you wear a wide hat. But um, they, don't, they don't seem to... I don't know whether they can't get a grip on the blue. If you get one and you squash it, it will it prick you, and it won't be bad prick. It'll only be a bit of a prick. Um, I've never, ever really had bad. My, I've got a worker who's about six foot four or five or something, 
and uh, he he tends to get around with his bum crack showing, so you know where he gets stung. He doesn't he doesn't get stung with through the blue. He's always oh. <laughs> so, so it's always entertaining. You know? Now we're talking before about getting messy and whatever with honey. The blue jacket. Oh, you might have to. Um, it might be a bit loose in the. Um, in no, the... no, they just get through the. I don't know why, but they do. <laughs> oh, don't know. Don't. You're sure? You're sure you haven't got a hole in it? No, there's no hole. In the blue jacket. It's immaterial what they get you. No matter no, how no. careful you are. What I'd suggest is just make sure you're short. Sure... Yeah. No, they don't get you. Uh, oh, okay. Well, we we wear them every day, and we don't. I'll change your queens. You better get a new queen off me and they'll give, send you ones that don't stink through the blue. Um, now, people have been wearing leather je- gloves in the past. In, in England, they discovered that the disease was being spread by, around the hives by beekeepers' leather gloves because you, the wax, the honey, and that sticks to the leather. You go to the next hive and you're transferring it. These are actually a nitrile-covered glove and so you can wash them. And so you can, keep, you can actually put them in soapy water as you're working, wash the, the stuff off, and it's much better for less transmission of disease. How much so, is that? $20 for you. OK? <laughs> 20, 25 to everyone else. <laughs> but there, yeah, so... Um, but there should be two sizes, but when I, when I ordered them, they only had one size left in stock, so I ended up with double... Yeah, well, yeah, so they ended up being the large ones that came out. Um, and then, just for devilment, I saw these and I bought these pith hats because, you know, once in the 70s, all the beekeepers all wear, wore pith hats because they were cool to wear. And just for devilment, I also bought the bamboo hats that they wear over in China. I didn't bring one with me, but you could have tried it out. I don't know, they must have terribly hard heads. It is the most awfulest thing to put on your head. You'd have to put a beanie on or something first before you put it on. But anyway, so for those who are interested in those, we've got them here. Now, getting back to more interesting things. I believe beekeeping is going to change radically because in the past... I went to a beekeeping talk one time and they were all talking feeding bees, feeding bees for you take all the honey off your hives, feed them sugar syrup for the winter, you know, feed them, feed them. And someone said, and what do you do? How much sugar do you feed? And I said, nothing. I don't, I think feeding bees is bad beekeeping. Just give them a bit of diesel and shift them to somewhere else. <laughs> it didn't go over very well with the, with the audience because they were all very keen feeders of bees. Anyway, since then I have had to change because this last 12 months around Geelong area and parts of central Victoria have been the worst for probably 50 years. We have never had such a hard time as what we've just gone through. Probably wasn't as bad up here because you get a bit more rain and you had a bit of messmate flowering and stuff. But we really, really struggled and the bees really struggled because we didn't have very good pollens coming in a lot of the time. So if you feed your kids, kids on lollies all day, they're going to be runts, you know, and they're going to come out this big. If you feed them on good stuff, they're going to come out six foot eight high, you know. So anyway... <laughs> oh, you ought to see how big the queens are that I am. <laughs> anyway, when I first saw this stuff and I bought some as a trial, uh, it came and it got seized by customs because it didn't have the approvals for Australia. So as a result, I had to go into uh, hold, bond, and they were about to destroy it when eventually the company came up with all the right answers and they released it, and I got it with all this thing. So it's, it's been proven not to have put residues in your honey or your, your hive. It's uh, natural and whatever. Now, what it's made of is when you go down to the beach, forget the big bull kelp. There's a finer kelp that's about an inch across roughly a fine leaf kelp but it's brown and wrinkly and long and that's what they gather they ferment it for about 90 days or thereabouts with herbs and the originally they were making it as the equivalent of maxi crop sea sole those products to put on pastures in New Zealand to grow 
crops and things like that. They discovered that the farmers were feeding it in the water to their cattle and their sheep, and they were doing better. So they actually made one specially for livestock. Then they discovered that the beekeepers were very tricky because when they go to their kiwi fruit, they get paid for the strength of the hive and it's very hard to keep their bees strong on the kiwi fruit because of the poor pollens and whatever. And the beekeepers were feeding in the sugar syrup to the bees and they were getting 80% more brood. And if you actually put a little bit more of it in, you can get another 20%. Um, so they got to and they made some for beekeeping. Then uh, the likes of this problem, we, uh, someone queried as to whether it had residues and that. So they got some scientists to actually do more testing on the beekeeping one and they found that they'd fluked it uh, from the word go. Only just some slight alterations they needed to make to it. But it's the minerals, the amino acids and the vitamins, the combination or something in that stimulates your bees. So anyway, when it arrived, uh, after it got cleared out of customs, we were on a really good honey flow. We'd been on red gum, then we had mana gum, and so as a result, the bees were in good nick. So I didn't think I needed to feed it. But I was trying to requeen my hives, and we'd do a graft, and there'd only be two or three cells at the most being drawn by the, by the bees. And I thought, oh, something's wrong. I'm doing something wrong. Why is this? And now when I think back on it, Dad used to always grizzle that, oh, the honey flow's too strong, the bees won't draw queen cells, there's too much honey coming in. You know, we always had, at times, this problem where the bees wouldn't make the queen cells. So I rang up my friend and I said, how are you going making queen cells? Oh, he said, the no, bees won't do it. I rang up another one, no, nah, the bees won't make them. So anyway, I thought I'll try this stuff out. So I gave the bees a feed with this agressy. Went back a couple of days after I'd fed them and done the graft. I couldn't believe it. Bees that wouldn't draw them the week before, full bar. Might be only one cell missing. Everyone you put in. I thought, wow, there's something, there's something in this. Australia's soils are old. They're lacking in minerals. They're lacking in things. Our bees have, have been bred or evolved in other parts of the world where there's different things in the pollen. Our bees are living on eucalypt pollens and stuff like that that, weren't, that haven't evolved with our bee. So there's something missing in the amino acids or something. And, the, and so anyway, we started feeding it to the bees when we make the queen cells. Not only do they make them more of them, but they make them bigger and they come out really big. And, you know, a commercial beekeeper was down one day and I showed him the cells. He said, I've never seen cells so big. I said, that's what they do when they, you feed them with the sugar syrup and amino and the uh, agressive. So anyway, that was the year before. Last year, we were ticking along, everything's good. And at this stage, I hadn't been feeding the breeder queens. And with this at the end of February, January, we had a dearth. We really, you could make cells by feeding the sugar syrup and agressive, but it was, it was hard going. What happened is I went to graft this day and the bees were wanting to rob and oh, everything was going wrong. And you couldn't graft because the bees, was, the grubs were so dry, they were very hard to lift off the, out of the combs. So I thought I'd feed the breeders. So I gave for the four breeders on the, on the pallet all a litre and a half of agressive sugar syrup and... Um, uh, 20 mils of um, agressy. I came back the next day and I could not believe my eyes. All the grubs were floating on milk, a big layer of milk. Anybody could have grafted them, even a kid could have grafted them. And once again, back, we were back in business. It was obvious that there's something in that that at times, even when we think our bees are going well, they're, they're missing something. So I've been selling it mainly, well, all over the place. Uh, and basically, I can post out the one litre and five litre. Um, the 20 litre has to go with Fastway. Otherwise, if you want the 100 litre and bigger, you've got to come down and pick it up. Anyway, so it's been going to New South Wales and Western Australia, all over the place, all over country Victoria. Where it be the other day, a fellow came up to me and he said, I've got my bees in my backyard at uh, Keela and I've been feeding this through the winter. I said, oh, yes. He said, my bees are triples. Do you think they'll swarm? <laughs> oh, I said, I know they'll swarm. <laughs> so I advised, don't feed them to the bees in the winter time. You know, give them a feed before we knock off in, in, say, late May. A couple of doses, and the, 
it appears that one of the things that happens with it is it gets rid of the nicema. So in New Zealand, they give them a couple of feeds in May before the bees go to bed, and then they give them a couple of doses about now onwards. As soon as you see the pollen coming in, because it's a waste of time giving it to bees before there's available pollen. And I was at a meeting where a fellow explained that even with sugar and stored honey and whatever, the bees still need pollens and things to synthesise the, the pollen to be able to make it into food for their bees. And that makes sense to me because, you know, like you can be on good conditions and yet you can have weak bees. What you see in your beehive now is what you'll see in three months' time. You know, if they're on good condition now, well, they'll be good in three months or two or three months' time. There's a time lag. And that's why people go to the almonds. Their bees have had a bad autumn on sugar gum or something like that. Low-quality pollens, nothing much. They go up to the almonds. Bees all fly out, and in four days, they've only got half the bees in their boxes, and they all scratch their head and go, oh, what's happened? That's why I think this stuff's going to really come into play. Uh, in the next four, four, three or four years, we're going to need 300,000 beehives to pollinate the almonds. And there's only going to be one way we're going to be able to do it. That's going to be by feeding bees uh, supplements. How do you put it in? How sugar you... syrup. Ah, put it in the sugar Sh syrup. Yeah. And you can use a feeder like this. Right? But we've... That's what the New Zealanders would tell you to do. Feed it. They put a whole... A whole oh, and, and the other trick, too, is go down to Mr Bunnings, buy the cheapest gutter guard and just cut it up and put it in there and not one bee will drown. They use it as a ladder to climb up and down. Right, these are new ones that have come from Turkey. Um, there's a bit of a story. You, you think, you think uh, in Turkey they must use um, dadent-sized frames because I bought those plastic boxes and the idea is the frames sit in them, but they're that much too short. Uh, we use Langstroth, which looks the same but must be slightly different in size. Um, so, yeah, so that's one way. But we've got a better way. You know, Australians' ingenuity is... You can't beat Aussies for ingenuity. And a beekeeper worked out you can put it in the water and spray it. And when he works his hives, and we've been doing the same thing, you go down to Mr Bunnings and you buy a garden sprayer, one of those little pump-up sprayers, you put the... It doesn't work with sugar syrup because it won't spray very well. But with water, you pump it up with uh, 20 or 30 lit millimetres to the litre of water. And as you finish working your bees, you can spray it over them. If they've got empty cells, spray it into the cells, put it back. But when you extract the honey, you spray a bit over the sticky frames, put them on the hive. The water makes it easier for the bees to lick and clean up and clean up. But also they get a bit of agressive makes your bees a lot stronger. Also, they don't seem to have nosema. It reduces your nosema. One beekeeper in Bendigo, he's been doing it for four years using a, a similar product, and he hasn't had any nosema since he's been feeding his bees with the uh, uh, Hive Alive. The Hive Alive comes from uh, Ireland. It's more expensive and it's smelly because they put thymol in it. They put thymol in it for the varroa. Well, we don't have varroa, so we don't have to worry about that. So I've learnt not to believe everything that's on the internet, but I saw a video one time on YouTube and they got the beehive and I, I had the good fortune some four, four years ago, five years ago it must have been, to go to Turkey and I went on a beekeeping tour that went up into the mountains and we saw the original Caucasian, grey mountain Caucasian bees and I learnt as you drove along, you know, there's something like... A, 150,000 commercial beekeepers in Turkey, 6.3 million beehives. Um, beekeeping is big over there. Uh, they are also big on feeding sugar to their bees too, so don't think all their honey's going to be uh, honey. A lot of it is uh, pretty laced up with sugar. But I went and saw a very ethical uh, foundation called Tima, and they believe in organic honey and all this sort of thing. You know, they were selling for about 40 euros a kilo organic honey from the white rhododendrons that grow up in the high areas. Well, um, going back to how I went there, is originally they were, the people were out here at Appamondia when we had the Appamondia in 2007 at, uh, down at Jeff Shed, or well, not Jeff Shed, the convention centre. And um, anyway, they were handing out these pamphlets 
go for a t- beekeeper's tour of Turkey. So I went home and I said to my late wife, I said, I want to go on this. And she read that to get to some of the bee sites, you had to ride a horse. <laughs> no, she wasn't going to ride a horse, so that was scratched off, you see, quick smart. Because what happened is when they, this team went through Turkey, finding, they evaluated all the animals, birds, insects, fish, all the living things and categorised it. They discovered one, every 10 days a new species or something they didn't know that they had. And um, because carnations, freesias, all of those pl- flowering plants all came from Turkey. Uh, they might have, other countries might have got them since and uh, developed them, but they all go back to there. Because of the Ice Age, everything was pushed down into that belt. They found in these really remote high mountain areas two different strains of Caucasian bees had survived the Euro- Varroa when it went through. What happened is Abidjan, uh, all the countries around that had these bees, the Varroa came through, killed them all, and when they replaced, the beekeepers replaced their bees, they got bees from Iran and took them up there, and they were totally useless bees, unsuitable, stingy, don't make honey. Hopeless. 17 kilos of honey, average production of hive um, for a year. And the centre of um, uh, Turkey has a bee called the Mulga bee and the Anatolian bee. Once again, breed like stink, swarm like anything, but don't make much honey. But these grey mountain Caucasian bees, and I'll tell you a story about this. We had them in Australia years ago, and and I'm sure they were the same thing. They were called Everett Hastings Caucasians. And I was only a kid, about eight or ten, and Dad used to take us up to Glen Rowan because Linton Briggs used to organise the field days up there. And in the middle of the cricket pitch in this big oval, there was three hives set up. I look back on it now and I presume one was the Caucasians, one would have been something else, and the others were bright yellow Italians. So we get, I wander over as a kid and there's beekeepers standing there looking as they usually do before the main event, and uh, the bees are flying and anyway the Italians are zipping in and out and the, probably the Carney Islands in the middle are going in and out and that, and these Caucasians are just slowly going in and out. So anyway, so someone said, oh... I don't think they're much good, these bees are Briggsies, you know, they're not flying much. So anyway, hmm, so anyway, so they started kicking the boxes <laughs> to see if they'd come out the front, you see. So anyway, oh yeah, the Italians all zoomed out, oh yeah, look how lively they are. Oh, and the other ones, oh yeah, a bit, oh, kick the box, no, oh, these black ones don't do much, yeah. So anyway, someone got the bright idea to lift the lid off. Well, they lifted the lid off. Now, you've seen those cartoons of Winnie the Pooh on TV, you know, and, or whatever, and the bees are chasing the bear and they all have to jump in the pond. Well, everyone had to run. And I was very lucky. I didn't get stung. But I remember seeing this bloke that had lifted the lid off and he's running for his life and he's rolling around on the ground, clutching at his face and his neck, and they absolutely gave him a belting. So... <laughs> Don't kick the boxes and make sure you've got a smoke when you lift the lid off. But anyway, that was my first vision seeing of those bees. And I had a rather exciting start to my turkey trip because what happened is they lost my case the first, the first day. And I'm there thinking, that I had a bee veil in that case. I'm probably going to need it when I go out looking at all these bees. Well, I got my case back. That's another long story. But I never wore the veil the whole time. I was over there, the bees were so quiet, we were in apiaries with 500 um, breeder support bees, queen breeders and drone mothers, 1,000, 1,200 mini nukes, never had to wear a veil, they were so quiet and I thought we need to get these bees to Australia. Those bees, I don't know how they'd handle our heat because they, ha- they can survive 40 degree below temperatures, so they're very, very hardy. By selective breeding, picking the best all the time, those bees now produce triple the honey of, when, of the background bees that they started with. If they go to the villages and look at their bees and compare them with these ones that they've selected, it's uh, three times more honey production a year. So now they're distributing them to the beekeepers all through Turkey. Anyway, getting back to, you'd look, drive along and you'd see in the distance a white tent and um, 200, 400 hives on the side of a hill. And... I always wondered why everywhere we went, we'd, we'd go and see the imam and we'd be, you know, 
yapping away to the imam. And I thought, geez, these imams are very important over here. Well, Turkey's still tribal. And so what happens is the imam that runs this area is the man who says, you can put your bees over there. You can put your bees over there. So they have to go to them and, and get the permission. So that's why... I be- yeah, same sort of thing. But it's the imam. So, it, so we're always going to see imams. Anyway, and that's how they get their bee sites. And um, anyway, we'd look for that. So on the YouTube, I saw where they got one of these products. They put it in an empty box in front of this 400 hives or whatever, put it there... And I don't know whether it's slow motion or trick photography. Anyway, you watch it for a few minutes and then all of a sudden a swarm just goes straight and into the box. And I thought, well, we'll give it a try. So I've imported some of this spray and this one, you... What is the yeah, you, you put your hand there. <laughs> yeah, you'll get a swarm. You'll catch a swarm. <laughs> lemongrass. Lemongrass, it's there. And that's as a, as a spray. And this one is in beeswax. And you saw me before hanging on to it. You, you have to soften it before you can then apply it to the inside of the box. At this stage, we haven't used it, so I don't know whether they're going to work. But they're both, they're both different formulas, but they both have definitely have lemongrass in them. So that seems to be the magic stuff. Um, has anyone got any questions about what I've been waffling on about? I don't want to <laughs> and you know, you know, over in New Zealand, some people drink 10 mils a day in their orange drink. They reckon it's good for you. <laughs> when, when we put it in water, we, we put 40, 40 mils per litre of water. And in sugar syrup, we do 20 per litre. But in New Zealand, they put 30 per litre. But it seems 20 to 30 per litre seems to work. Um, I think they usually do about two feeds a, a, a season, you know, at, at a time, a week or two apart. But um, when I make up McQueen cells, I do one <laughs> feed of about a litre the day before to prime the bees... It, it seems to make them make royal jelly. It, it stimulates them. It's the amino acids, I think, that does it. And then, for the f- till they seal up the cells, I try to make sure they've got uh, some in there all the time. So generally, every day or every second day, I just top up uh, about another litre of it. Does anyone have any idea what these are used for? No, no. I, I didn't know until a, a British beekeeper came one day and showed me. Um, in Canada, they use them as clearers. They make up boards and they have them like this so the bees go out and they can't find their way back in. But uh, people use them to catch swarms and so it's much easier to have a, a bucket, you know, like a 20-litre, uh, 25-litre bucket... If you're going to climb up a ladder or whatever, shake the swarm in, a few land on the ground. And they have four of these, drill a hole and put them in so that they're like that. The bees go in, they go into the bucket, generally around the bottom, go up and cluster at the top. And you can come back an hour later or whenever, just pick the bucket up and take it home. And you can probably drive along and they're not going up and down the windows either. <laughs> the big advantage. <laughs> well, you'd, the queen would have to be in the bucket. You'd have to shake, you shake the majority of the bees in the bucket and then the, the rest will go in. But that's what they use. So you just drill a hole, put that like so, bees will go in and they don't come back out. And so, uh, but I'm sure that beekeepers are being very inventive. They'll use them for getting them out of walls of houses and all sorts of things as well. So uh, there you are. Now, oh, something else. Oh, I forgot to bring something today. Now, has anyone got any idea what this is for? There you are. This will try your imagination. It's, uh, all right. These... When, 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 when we make our queen cells, or use our queen cells, I've always mainly used the plastic cells, um, and uh, they work all right in that. But I am conscious these days of doing things as natural as possible. And what I discovered is sometimes when you put brand new queen cells, the black plastic ones, the queens wouldn't work them. And 
you have to put them in the hive for a day or two for the bees to clean them up and whatever. My guess is they probably use some sort of recycled horrible plastic and put black in it to hide whatever it is. And the bees go, don't like that. And so as a result, they don't want to make queens. So when I was in Turkey, I noticed that they always all used natural beeswax cells. But they're very, very hard. You know, you can get like a pencil and dip it in the wax, dip it in two or three times, then try and get it off and all that. Very slow, very hard work, even when you had a thing that did six at a time. And I invariably broke them in the water. But I discovered these silicon moulds and what I do is I get in a warm room and, and I just get a teaspoon of... I have the fry pan with beeswax and I just give it a teaspoon at a time into the little mould, give it a little tap so it all goes down around it and it cools very quickly and you can do that and you can pop them out and you've got perfect little um, wax queen cells that you can do your graft in, perfectly natural, and hopefully it'll, you'll, it'll all work better. But anyway, so we, we've now got those two. So um, now, has anyone got any questions? I'm sure you're full of questions. Oh, I forgot the main thing. You're right, I do use open bottoms. I'm glad you're here. Oh, jeez. You can come and help me all the time. Mm. Now... Many moons ago, I was in Melbourne section and there was a fellow called Chris Allen and he had some bamboo queen excluders. Oh, yes, so I got a couple off him, took them home, tried them. Yeah, these are good. Bees like them. They wriggled through them, no troubles. So I said to Leon, who just started business then, I said, get me a heap of these. So anyway, he got them in from China. So straight off down to the bees, put them on the bees down at Torquay, box on. It was... Uh, about a month later, don't worry about your bees swarming. They don't generally swarm much till September onwards, and you're probably a bit colder than us down there too. Our biggest problem nowadays is canola makes our bees swarm, and in a lot of cases we can't get away from the canola. But um, anyway, getting back, and you'll have a good season this year because we've had rain, whereas the last few years. So anyway, I put the bamboo excluders on, came back a week or two later to see what was going on. The bees had been swarming. Oh, no bees in the top box. Most of them are swarmed. What's going wrong here? And I was just standing there looking, and I could see all the heads lined up looking through at me, but they couldn't get through. Oh, so anyway, go home, measure them. I said, Leon, they're too small. They were for Asian honeybees. The Asian honeybee is that much smaller, just a little bit smaller. Yeah. So he said, burn them. Well... My sneaky worker made bird cages out of some of them. <laughs> but I made, oops, I made bottom boards out of them. Because what I found since is screen bottoms like this work really well and there's big advantages. And what happened is when we had that varroa exercise down at uh, the wharf last year, all the, it was a real pest doing the testing because nobody had their hives set up for when Varroa comes. When Varroa comes, you'll most likely have to have a screen bottom because when the Varroa falls off the bee, it falls out, and once it falls more than 30 millimetres, it can't walk back in, it can't get back in. So it's one way of controlling them. The other thing, too, is since then, um, if you're going to put strips in you need to be able to put a slide in like so. So up here, if you're worried about the cold, you can put your slide in for the winter and keep your bees that little bit warmer if you're worried. But I, I don't. I just no, have them anyway. And, yeah, you gave your ear. And when you do your testing, you'll be able to put your sticky mat on here, do your test, pull it out, see how many varroa you got, and that'll determine as to whether you've got to test your bees or not. But the thing I like about these over... These work all right, mm. but the chalk brood will on stick on it and the bees clean it, but the weaker ones don't clean it very well. Whereas they fall through the bamboo bases. So, but the only thing is, when I first made them, I used to have a, a billet hive loader. So you'd put the um, forks in and if you weren't very careful, you were certainly open entrance once you uh, broke the uh, bamboo. <laughs> 
But that also has worked because last, uh, last year someone decided to steal some of my hives mm. and they locked up ten hives but they only took five. My guess is they locked the entrance and didn't realise that the hive loader had broken the base of one of them and as they were lifting them over the fence they got stung to bits <laughs> <laughs> and so they gave up. I reported to the police. Police were not very interested. Yeah, beehives are all too tricky for them. Uh, so the thieves come back, cut the fence and stole another five later on. So, and, and last, on, while we were on the way up here today, uh, we had a phone call from a beekeeper in Geelong and uh, someone last night went into the backyard of the uh, friend's property and we're going to steal the hives except his dog uh, <laughs> saved the day. So... Theft is going to be a come, become a problem. I left one hive behind up at Hopeton on one of my bee sites because it's handy to go up and have a look to see if they're doing any good, whatever. Someone's decided to knock it off, so it's now gone. One of my friends went past, went to have a look to see the beehive. It's gone. So, so it'll be on the way to the almonds, I suppose. And that's another reason why I like using jumbos, because other people haven't got them. But... It still doesn't stop people from stealing them, obviously. John, that, that, that brood box, I got five of them. Only, yes. I use them only for brood boxes. You can't use them for honey because it's too heavy. It's heavy. heavy. So I got five of them. Well, what I do is the eight frames full depth is the equivalent of a ten frame full depth box, yes. which is the perfect size for a queen. So basically you don't have to do so much work stopping swarming. But one of the tricks we do is when we have canola, it jazzes the bees up so much because cause also there's most likely canola, there's most likely in the uh, faber beans and other mm. cape weed and stuff nearby. Our bees just boil up. So what we do is we put a full depth on top, pull the excluder out, let the bees come up, and once they've laid that up, we take it away, so that's your artificial swarm. The best way of stopping swarming is to take away bees. So... Uh, the, the jumbo eight frame yeah. is the equivalent to brood the brood box of a ten frames of full depth, full depth. It's the same size. So if you go to the almonds and they want nine frames of bees, one of these technically is, full of bees is technically ten frames of bees. You've just got to remind them each time because they just think that they're an eight-frame full-depth box. But uh, yeah, I've gone to the bees, uh, almonds for 25-odd years with just uh, a single uh, jumbo and they've, they've been quite happy and they've had plenty of bees. And basically, this time of the year, what I would expect to see if I opened up my hives... Oh, now was the other thing I was going to tell you. When you want to have a peek at your bees, there's a big, big advantage with my plastic because... There's your hive at the moment, and I know you'll get curious and you want to see how many bees are in there. You can lift the lid off and peel back this insulation, and you can see through the clear plastic and see how many bees are in there. They don't. They don't. They don't you're not disturbing them. They just sit there and they go, "What are you doing, looking at us?" And you can see whether you've got four frames, six frames, or a full box of bees. Because, and you haven't disturbed them by opening them um, because it's not letting the air in or anything. So it's, it's, it's a real advantage that way. I see the latest thing is in Canada now they're using some sort of double insulated mats. I don't know what it's made out of, but I'm going to see if I can get them because I think insulation of the, the top is, is an important thing. And in the, winter, in the summertime, because I have four hives on a pallet, two facing this way, two facing that way. And the entrances nowadays generally are in the corners. So that lot of bees come to that corner. This lot of bees come to this corner. It helps to stop drift. Um, I used to put the hives side by side to keep them warm, but the only problem is the little black ants love getting in that gap and drive me mad. So I have a little gap now so that the ants got nowhere to hide. So they tend to get up on top of your plastic, don't they? But anyway, <laughs> anyway, so ants are a, ants are a four-letter word. Um, but getting back to the other thing too is with the um, bottom board with the screen and that, a lot of the why I have this gap here is a lot of the bees fly back and you'll see they fly underneath. They don't go through the entrance. I forgot about that thing moving. Um, and um, 
you pull the hive back and you'll discover that you've got a big cluster of bees that underneath and they actually you, pass the nectar through the screen. When you take that, that bottom board is not good for a box to get a high swarm. Uh, swarm. No, no. Because when you take the swarm, <laughs> they, they're all underneath they, and the rest of the box are that's what, inside. That's, outside. Yeah, and that's why it's, that's why it's good to move when you're moving bees. Yeah, you've got to do yeah. it when it's very cold yeah, or, or with a forklift so, yeah. because you get a rather rude shock when you lock the door and you uh -huh. pick them up and you discover that they're all falling down your legs, your pants, because you've got to cluster underneath the <laughs> underneath the hive. But they try the, to get into the because the green is there, they try to get in from uh, underneath, not from the To screen. them that screen yeah. is not a barrier no. because they, they talk and, and communicate yeah. through it. When we're shifting, the bees will get under there yeah. and um, keep themselves cool so that they travel much better. You can lock you can lock the entrance but they're getting plenty of yeah. air through yeah. the bottom. Yeah. And in the hot weather up in the Mallee, what I do is I put um, cardboard over the four mm. hives and then I put an old pallet on the top mm. and that gives them a shade. Mm. Some places we put the bees we haven't got trees for shade, mm. they're out in the open and the heat is the biggest. Bees can cope with cold, not a problem, it's heat. When you get 43 degree days and hot north wind, that's, the hard, that's what knocks your bees and bees may take the rest of the season to come good after uh, getting cooked. Um, what happened this year is bees keepers went up to the northeast put their bees on the red stringy bark. Most of the places up there, they've got to put them out in the paddocks in the open. They got those heat events on them, cooked their bees. Those bees have taken all the rest of the year to come good again. So that's why there's a lot of weak bees. Some beekeepers have lost a third of their bees, commercial beekeepers, this last 12 months. John, with that brood box, do you have the second brood box on top of it as well, or you just have this one? Just, just once, the, once the swarming spring's finished, just the, uh, the, just the excluder, and we use generally three um, uh, ideals. And when the top bottom is full, we put a clearer board in and just come back two or three days later I just, and take the box I just off. Put another brood and, box and then you put. I put another box on top and then I put a box for my suckers. We, 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 don't, we, we don't have to worry about that because once the season's going well and your pasture's swarming, that's enough there. And all you have to do is every now and then, uh, every uh, six weeks or so, just inspect the bottom and take the outside frames out that are full up with honey and pollen and you can take them out. We make nukes out of them. We take two out of each hive and to make another nuke because we need to keep making nukes all the time for our queen breeding. Because with your queen breeding, there's always some that don't take and whatever. Yeah. And, uh, and queen breeding is another whole... We could talk all day. That's another whole big session. But what happens nowadays is we always put cages on our cells because in the old days we didn't cage the cells and quite often the bees will chew the side and kill them and knock them down. Nothing more frustrating than to think you're going to go out and put queen cells out and, oh, where are they all gone? A virgin may have flown in from somewhere else and knocked them down or the bees decided the weather's not right today and they chew down cells. So we cage them now. And then if the weather's bad, they hatch out into the cages and we actually cage them into, I didn't bring any, but little cages and we actually introduce them as virgin queens. Mm -hmm. And we now have nearly as good a success with virgin queens as what we do with cells. And if you had said that five years ago, I would have laughed at you. But we've learnt what to do, um, uh, how to do it. We don't make up a small nuke and we shift it. And that works really, really well. So, um, yeah, it's, quite, it's all adaption and beekeeping is changing all the time. When you go to Appamondia, a couple of years ago, I heard them say that the bee research that's going on in the world now is doubling every year. The amount of papers that were delivered every 10 years is double. There's just more and more research being done. We're learning more and more things, like who would ever have thought, and I don't know how they, how, where they find these bees that talk, but they somehow find bees that talk, because <laughs> when the bees fly at full speed, they see in black and white, because they've only got a little brain. And when they get to where they want to go, they turn on the colour vision and slow down, and then they can see the flowers in colour. But they see blues, whites, uh, yellow. Um, that's why they're saying if you want to make your, uh, stop the drifting and sharp lines. Uh, 
sharp vertical lines or horizontal lines, those three little things on the top of their head, they actually see them better, black against yellow. That, uh, they really see that. And, for example, shiny aluminium is the colour that they see the best, and that's a very vivid blue to them. They can see that. Um, it's things that we didn't know before. Um, I was going to say something else. And the other thing, too, is, you know, we think we invented the web, the World Wide Web, you know, computers all linked. Now we realise the bees invented it. Because when they come home at night, they go in here and they sit there and they, they all talk to each other. They can talk, they can vibrate, they can make pheromones, they can do all sorts of communication. And it's the wisdom of the hive. So the stronger the hive, when you've got 60,000 bees in here, not only do they talk and say, go around to Jenny's place or go over to Mary's place, there's a good honey flow there, they work it out, but they also work out the mathematics. And I saw this one time, I had bees on a property where I had big, strong breeder hives and I had little nukes, little three and four frame nukes. The little four frame nukes only had yellow pollen in them, which was the mustard. The mustard was all around for the first four kilometres. If they could fly more than four kilometres, there was Patterson's Curse on a neighbouring farm. The very big strong hives had purple and yellow. They, because they're big and strong, they go, that's more productive, there's a better honey flow, and we can afford to go and get it. It's, more, it's risky to go and get it, but we'll go and get it. So they would go, fly the distance, get that Patterson's curse, bring it back. The little wheat nuke go, oh, I'm not going that far. I'm only just going close to home. And so they only had the yellow pollen. Another time I saw that same thing. A farmer asked me to take bees to pollinate his cherries on the nets. So get there, you can't drive in. You've got to pick up the hive, carry it in and put it all around under all the different trees, all through his orchard on the side of a hill. Well, it nearly killed me, you know. So I, I muttered and groaned about it. Went up, oh, he was happy enough, wrote out a cheque. So anyway, so when I got the hives home, I wasn't all that happy. They, they hand, didn't live under the nets very well. They didn't handle it uh, because they want to fly out, you see, and the nets muck them up. So anyway, the next year I said to him, I'll only come if I can use nuke boxes. I want to put five frame nukes in because in Western Australia they discovered a tube of bees with a couple of kilos of bees in a tube pollinated the cherries better than a strong hive because a small hive only flies a short distance. So if you put them in the middle of an orchard, they only go to the orchard. Whereas you put a strong hive there, they go, oh, we're going to nick off and go down the road. We'll go to the blackberries or something else, you know. So anyway, I go up there, put all these nukes, much easier to walk in, put them all down amongst the orchard, and he's all very, hmm, not sure about this. They've never seen nukes before, you know, this is not going to work. Anyway, came back, I got grizzles. You know what the grizzles were? There's too many cherries on the trees. <laughs> <laughs> you looked at the trees, they were on angles like this, and they were just like grapes all the way up and down. Every flower, those bees had pollinated because they were just little and they didn't go nicking off trying to go somewhere else and they just stayed in under the, under the nets. So if you want to pollinate under nets properly, use four-frame, five-frame nukes and you'll get to do a lot better job. You want to wind me up, don't you? I can tell. <laughs> There's lots to learn with beekeeping. Oh, yeah, that, that would be good. <laughs>